Welcome to the worship of First Congregational United Church of Christ of Boulder. We're so glad that you have joined us this day. As we come together, we give thanks that new every day is God's love for us. And all day long, God is working for good in the world. May God do some good work in us this day, lifting us with the wings of song, healing us with the balm of prayer, inspiring us with the gospel word of grace, sowing seeds of goodness and kindness, of justice and joy among us, blessing us that we may turn and be a blessing to others. Friends, although we are apart, we are also together, offering our love, our commitment, our hope, and our prayers in service to one another and to God's world. Together, let us worship God in the beauty of holiness. And friends, peace be with you. Peace be with you. May you sense divine peace at all times. Peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Peace of Christ with you. Can you say it? May the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. Good job. You put me down. Yes. Peace be with you and with all God's children. The peace of Christ be with you. Peace be with you, my friends.
Let us pray. God of all creation, you call us to be co-workers in your vineyard. Plant the seeds of renewal deep within our lives. Rain your mercy on us in the morning. Shine the warm sun of your joy in the afternoon. Nurture our growth in faithfulness, the spreading vines of a wide community rooted in love and justice. May your garden grow and flourish within and among us, that our lives may bear every fruit of your spirit. All this we pray as we lift our hearts to you in praise. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is Matthew's version of the parable of the sower. It's from the 13th chapter, the first in a parade of parables in this gospel, which may explain Matthew's decision to tell a long version of this story. Perhaps it was a way to ease the followers of Jesus into these stories about the realm of God, where Jesus uses elements everyone would recognize, things as ordinary as the crops in their fields, but tells them with a surprising and sometimes perplexing twist. The parable of the sower inspired this illumination in the St. John's Bible. It's such a striking image that I now can't hear this familiar parable without seeing this image in my mind's eye. As I read our scripture passage, I invite you to linger over it too. Notice the four kinds of soil. Notice the seed. Notice the sower. What do you see as you look and listen for the living word of God? That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundred, some sixty, some thirtyfold. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. That is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty and in another 30. Holy wisdom, holy words, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Draw near to us, Holy Spirit, and make this ancient story come alive in us. Open our ears, our hearts, our minds, that we may receive the word you have for us this day. Amen. By the time Jesus gets to chapter 12 in Matthew's Gospel, it's clear things have become difficult for him. He's in conflict with the religious leaders of his community. They are now plotting to get rid of him. Then it seems he's at odds even with his own family, and soon he will also be rejected by his own hometown. Everywhere he turns, 
He runs into people who want to disregard his message and discredit his ministry. But when we get to chapter 13, Jesus takes a deep breath. He sits down to tell stories, one parable after another. The crowds gather around to hear what he has to say. He speaks about the realm of God, the kingdom of heaven, and about how by God's grace it will grow, even when it faces challenges and opposition and resistance, which is what the parable of the sower seems to be about. A sower goes out to sow, Jesus says, and the seed he sows falls on all sorts of situations. Sometimes the birds swoop in and gather up, gobble up all the hope of a new creation. Sometimes the soil is so hard and rocky and shallow that nothing meaningful can possibly take root deeply enough to make a lasting difference. Sometimes the weeds are so thick that they manage to choke out any life that seems to hold promise. And yet there are other times when the seed falls on soil that's just waiting for something good to happen. The time is right, the soil is ready, the seed is planted, sunshine and water help it to open, to take root, and to rise up. Sometimes the growth is great. Sometimes this grain stands tall. Sometimes it spreads across the field. It expands abundantly 30, then 60, then 100 times more. And if it seems like a miracle when it finally happens, That's because it is. And if we take this parable in the spirit in which it's told, there are factors that encourage the growth, of course, but there's also a randomness to it. All farmers, including those in Jesus' time, would never be as wasteful as the sower seems to be. What are we to make of this one who throws seeds everywhere, even in places where it's unlikely anything will come to fruition? What sort of a world is suggested by someone who throws seeds on a well-worn path where birds will eat it up, or on rocky ground where growth hardly stands a chance, or among thorns likely to crowd out everything else? Still, this reckless sower seems unconcerned and is willing to fling seed anywhere. Why is that? Well, maybe it's because Anywhere and everywhere is the arena of God's care, God's intervention, God's expansive love and our growth. And God is the first to know the truth that often that growth can't really be predicted. The sower is not so cautious and strategic as to plant seeds in only those places where the chances are best. Instead, it seems our God is a high-risk sower, indiscriminately throwing seed on soil of every kind as if all of it has the potential to be good soil. On the rocks, amid the thorns, in the weeds, and on the well-worn paths of all our lives, which may make us wonder if there is any place or circumstance in which God's seed cannot sprout and take root. In the summer of 1955, A woman from Montgomery, Alabama, attended a two-week training session at the Highlander Folk School in Tennessee. A founding purpose of the Highlander Center was to bring people together, black and white, to talk with each other and consider together how they might break down racial barriers and systemic inequalities in the South. When she arrived, the woman, by her own admission, felt uncomfortable and apprehensive She wasn't accustomed to such racial mixing where everyone called each other sister and brother. In time, however, the fresh air of this trustworthy community filled her soul. The mentors of the Highlander Center inspired their students to root their lives in courage rather than fear and to see themselves as sowers of the seeds of love and justice. Remarkably, Just four months later, these seeds yielded fruit. On December 1st, 1955, this woman named Rosa Parks 
refused to give up her seat in a white section of the bus in Montgomery. It was the beginning of the Montgomery bus boycott. The event changed her life. The event changed American history. For more than 70 years, African Americans had been sitting in on public transportation seeking to integrate it without much success. Then in 1955, the seed sown finally planted itself and grew to produce astonishing fruit, 30, 60, and 100-fold. There was cause for rejoicing. It was said that when Rosa Parks sat down, black people stood up. As a black maid in the second week of the boycott was reported to say, my feet are tired, but my soul is rested. And yet, as history has shown us over and over again, for every tender green shoot of new light taking root, rock-hard obstacles rise up to get in the way of its growth. Forces move in to choke it with weeds. As the parable reminds us, at best, there will be a 25% success rate in the planting. And the growth that comes is often so slow, chances are we will not be able to live long enough to experience the full fruit that gets produced by the sowing of justice. And then there are times when the opposition to the new creation completely overwhelms and an ending comes tragically, and we are left to wonder if God can work at all in the places where the landscape is covered with wreckage and the fields are watered only by our tears. On August 28, 1963, Martin Luther King stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial before a massive crowd. He spoke to the country about the fierce urgency of now. He captivated imaginations with his dream of our nation rising up to live out the true meaning of our creed his dream of his children living in a land where they are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. It was a magnificent moment in our history. The seedlings of a new creation spread out and grew taller that day. All who heard it found their souls filled with possibility and hope. It was a speech so clear and inspiring, it still has the power to stir us today. But then, just 18 days later, on September 15th, the terrain so full of promise was scorched to the ground. A bomb went off at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, killing four black girls as they were making their way through the church building to Sunday school, where they were learning to grow in faith. And Dr. King spoke again this time at their memorial service. These were the words he preached. These unoffending, innocent children were the victims of one of the most vicious and tragic crimes ever perpetrated. In a real sense, they have something to say to each of us in their death. They have something to say to every church's gospel ministry that has remained silent behind the safe security of stained glass windows. They have something to say to every politician who has fed constituents with the stale bread of hatred and the spoiled meat of racism. They say to each of us, black and white alike, that we must substitute courage for caution. They say to us that our work is not done, our prayers are not over, our learning is not yet complete, and our lives stand in need of holy, passionate interruption. It was nearly 60 years ago when Dr. King preached that sermon, but it sounds as if he could have said it a few days ago. If the last few weeks have taught us anything about racial injustice, it's that our work is not done, our prayers are not over, our learning is not yet complete, and our lives stand in need of holy, passionate interruption. Which is one way to interpret all the protests spreading like vines since the killing of George Floyd. 
a holy, passionate interruption, a heartbroken expression of grief and lamentation, a collective confession and reckoning with our nation's original sin, and a bold cry for justice in facing the systemic racism in policing and other parts of our society. A holy, passionate interruption made possible, of course, by the long, hard work of black activists and organizers, as well as the legacies and loved ones of Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, and the countless others whose names we say. But an interruption that perhaps is also a byproduct of COVID-19, when white allies in particular have been afforded more time to listen, to learn, and to act. All things which we as a congregation are endeavoring to do, turning this time into a season of gardening, sowing and tending, mulching and weeding and watering, so that the seeds of change among us can grow into sturdy plants with deep roots, with a prayer that they will expand 30 and 60 and 100 fold. By every marker, it seems we are living in the midst of a remarkable time, a liminal season. On the one hand, we face great, even terrifying uncertainty. On the other, we are holding tremendous possibility. It's the possibility I want to lift up for us. Last weekend, journalists in the New York Times noted that on June 6th, Half a million people turned out to proclaim that Black Lives Matter in nearly 550 places across the United States. That was at the peak of the protests, but that day was only one day in more than a month of demonstrations that still continue to today. Pollsters calculate that there have been more than 4,700 demonstrations in the United States since the first one on May 26th in Minneapolis. Between 15 and 26 million people have participated. You and I know that's just the number of people who were able to take to the streets. There's also an uncounted number of folks whose hearts and spirits are one with the protesters, but who are homebound because of the pandemic, a number that includes many of us. But here's the thing the sower of seeds wants us to see and hear. The conclusion the crowd counting experts and scholars have come to. These figures all point to the truth that we are in the midst of the largest protest movement in our country's history. The largest one ever. Add up all the demonstrations in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, and maybe you'll be as surprised as I was that the numbers of people involved don't come anywhere close. Hundreds of thousands of people then, tens of millions now. What's also significant are the many substantive reforms this current movement has already produced. Maybe you can keep up with the headlines. I can't, but here are a few. Cities and states, including our own, pass new laws banning chokeholds. In Minneapolis, the city council pledged to dismantle its current police department and rethink public safety. In New York, lawmakers repealed a law that kept police disciplinary records secret. Mississippi lawmakers voted to retire their state flag which includes the Confederate symbol. And then there's this. Douglas McAdam, a scholar at Stanford who studies social movements, made this hopeful observation. It looks for all the world, he says, like these protests are achieving what very few do, setting in motion a period of significant, sustained, and widespread social political change. We appear to be experiencing a social change tipping point that is as rare in society as it is potentially consequential. Watch 
gather hope because the seed seems to have caught on. But remember also how Bishop William Barber urged us to refuse to be too comforted too quickly at this time. Stay shaken, he says. Be restless. Our work is not done. Our prayers are not over. Our learning is not yet complete. We don't want to miss this chance to change and grow. We wouldn't want to stop short of the promise that this time may very well hold for us all. Some years ago, the Greek poet Dinos Christianpoulos wrote this beautiful couplet of defiance and hope. What didn't you do to bury me, but you forgot I was a seed? More recently, protesters in Mexico revised this little poem into a meme that people around the world now wear on a t-shirt or carry in a pocket and commit to memory. They tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. Those forces in our world that try over and over again to bury us in fear and despair, they don't know that we're seeds. Seeds sown by a high-risk sower who hasn't given up on us, who isn't finished with us, who still believes in our potential to change and to grow, who scoops us up and flings us out into the world with hope and with joy, trusting that within us and among us a new creation will take root and rise up, and it will expand and spread until it yields 30 and 60 and a hundredfold by the time the harvest rolls around. May that be our prayer. May that new creation come to fruition. May it be so. Amen.
Let us pray. God of all our labors, what is the profit of all our works if they don't draw us closer to you and our neighbor? Hasn't our teacher taught us that there is nothing in all the world of more value than our very soul? And yet how quickly are we encouraged to forfeit this soul for the temporary acceptance of a few years or a few people? Status, progress, success are all held before us like a carrot on the proverbial stick that we chase but never quite reach. One day and some day are promised to us, but those days never quite arrive. And it leaves us burdened. So we wonder from where does our help come, even as we tell ourselves that it comes from you. You who love us unconditionally. You who see us as you conceived us and not as we see ourselves and others. With perfect judgment, you see beyond the errors of our ways and call on us to live into your dream for us. From one moment of inspiration, you spoke all of eternity into being and prepared a place for each and every one of us. Remind us of this when we allow our fear of loss to dictate our contemplations. Speak this into our interactions as we wrestle with the choices laid out before us in these days. Surround us with this wisdom as our world is made new by facing the histories we've long tried to leave behind. In our prayers and in our presence, help us to build a capacity for sober compassion. As we challenge ourselves with new learning, remind us that we all crawled before we walked. There's much work to be done, but as Paul taught, if our work is not informed by love, it availeth little. So let us seek to do all things in love, even as we now pray in love for the family of Maya Rowan Yeager, who is working through some challenges right now, for Sue McCullough undergoing surgery this week, prayers for Chuck and Debbie Brown as Chuck was recently diagnosed with cancer. We pray for people who are losing hope in these days as they look at our world and see polarization, loneliness, loss in every possible capacity. We pray for those who are traveling right now, just trying to have some space in these difficult times, traveling mercies for all those who are journeying uh, to places, may they be safe, may they be healthy, uh, may they get to their destination without challenge. We pray also for all the workers, the essential workers and all those who are struggling right now, who have lost work, those who are being laid off, um, those who don't know what will come next, we pray for them also. We continue to pray for our leadership and for wisdom to reign in our hearts and in our minds. And may we be guided by your loving presence and the hope of the beloved community that you've embedded in all people of faith, of every faith. Help us in this community and beyond to be the hands and feet of Christ in the world. And God, may it be well with our soul and well with the souls of others as it was well with Jesus' soul who inspired this prayer. Ground of all being, mother of life, father of the universe, your name is sacred beyond speaking. May we know your presence. May your longings be our longings in heart and in action. May there be food for the human family today and for the whole earth community. Forgive us the falseness of what we have done as we forgive those who are untrue to us. Do not forsake us in our time of conflict, but lead us into new beginnings for the light of life, the vitality of life, and the glory of life are yours now and forever. Amen.
During the invitation to community life, we reflect on how the bonds that we've created in our community extend beyond mere social interactions, but rather they help us to cultivate uh, within ourselves the capacity to engage both within our community and beyond. If you haven't already, I invite you to look in the description box below where you'll find uh, links to the bulletin if you haven't already. Also a link to our friendship pad where you can leave information letting us know if you'd like to be added to our uh, email list or if you have prayers that you would like to us to be in prayer with you about as well as opportunities to continue, contribute to the continued ministry of this community uh, through online giving. And if you haven't already, we invite you to look at the announcements and see some of the things that are happening in our community right now. But I would like to highlight a few. Um, first off, um, immediately following this service, we'll have our virtual coffee hour where you can meet with other members of the community to engage, to laugh. We break into small groups and have conversation. If you're new to the community, there's also a um, coffee hour or a fellowship hour uh, following the service for newcomers and Reverend Chris will be um, meeting you in that group and you can learn more about the community I may pop in and other staff members may pop in as well Also coming up starting tomorrow. There's going to be uh, the white privilege. Let's talk curriculum and it begins on Monday and today's the last day to sign up So if you're interested, please send an email uh, to Reverend Chris or even myself or let us know in the in the uh, friendship pad that you're interested in joining that group. There are uh, dozens of people who are participating in this program, so it'll be an opportunity to engage with other people in the community uh, to learn more about this and other issues um, that we are working on in our society at large. Finally, I wanna bring up uh, church social gatherings, meaning meeting in person. There are eight uh, so far groups that will be meeting. The space is limited, so if you are interested, uh, please find the link in your weekly e or email or the Sunday email and let us know um, and just sign up and there are going to be spaces in people's backyards and there's a variety of different engagements. There's going to be a gathering that's a picnic, there's going to be a dinner one, there's a dessert one, other opportunities for you to engage. And also, um, before I forget, I want to mention that there will be a discussion group on July 17th about the movie The 13th. It's the 13th Amendment documentary by Ava DuVernay. Uh, Keith Lance is hosting that discussion group and information about that is also in the bulletin. So friends, we're just grateful to have you um, with us, have your presence. We're connected spiritually, we're connected communally, and we appreciate your presence here. And we look forward to gathering with you in all the ways that we can. Grace and peace.
As we go from worship, may God the sower sow among us seeds that will take root and grow into justice and joy for the world. May the God of seed and harvest bless us that our lives may bear the fruits of faithfulness, good words and good deeds, kindness, gentleness, compassion, mercy, and love. And may God, our creator, and Christ, our companion, and the Holy Spirit, our guide, be with you and go with you this day and forevermore. Amen.